Amen. Though we are reading and studying through the Old Testament, we do so as followers of Jesus, the Messiah revealed, not simply promised, not simply anticipated, revealed. Revealed in the fullness of time is the phrase that Paul, the apostle, used in, in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, the fullness of time. As followers of Jesus, one of our aims, one of our goals in reading and studying through the Old Testament should be what that very same apostle described in Romans 15.4. Take a look at that. Romans 15.4. He said this, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction was written for our instruction. Speaking of Paul, hold on to that. Speaking of Paul, listen to what the book of Acts tells us about how God was at work in the city of Ephesus through Paul's ministry. Now, the same guy who wrote Romans 15, 4, this is what we read. So after highlighting the miracles that the Spirit of God was doing through Paul, this is Acts 19. I'll have, we'll put the text up here on the screen for you. After highlighting these miracles, including many exorcisms, and how these seven Jewish exorcists who, who wanted the same fame, who wanted the same reputation as Paul, how they, we learned how they were humiliated by an evil spirit who then ended up confirming Paul's apostleship, really, and, and confirming that God was working through Paul. We read this in Acts 19, 17 through 20. And this, the miracles, the exorcisms, the humiliation of those so-called Jewish exorcists, this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Wonderful, isn't it? Extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and de divulging their practices. What are these practices? Take a look. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts, sorcery, witchcrafts, they brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. That's like in the millions of dollars today. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Acts 19, verses 17 through 20. Now notice that Luke, the author of Luke and Acts, notice that Luke is telling us something here about believers, not unbelievers. Believers. These were Christians who were confessing who were divulging, who were burning, as we see in verse 19. As we heard in verse 19, they were burning extremely expensive books, books or scrolls they once used to practice magic arts. So here's the question I want you to consider this morning. Can the Old Testament instruct us Remember, it was written for our instruction. Can it instruct us today in such a way that we better understand not only this book burning in first century Ephesus, but also that we could learn how to imitate the faith of those Ephesian believers? Can the Old Testament instruct us in that way? I believe the answer to that is yes. And I believe Judges 2, Judges chapter 2 is one of those places that can do this very thing. Judges chapter 2, if you haven't turned there, turn there in your Bibles. We're looking at verses 1 through 5 this morning. Navigate there on your device if you're using that this morning. Judges 2, 1 through 5. Listen to what the author of Judges, the book of Judges, tells us about the spiritual condition of God's people. We read, Now the angel of Yahweh went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, 
I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of Yahweh spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of that place Bokim, which means the weeping. And they sacrificed there to Yahweh. So here we are at the very beginning of the book of Judges. You would have read this in our Bible reading plan this last week. Come to these passages. We're here at the very beginning of the book. A good time indicator in terms of Israel's history. Where are we on the timeline of Israel's history? A good time indicator is found in the next set of verses. Look at verses 6 through 10. You can look at your subheading there in your Bible translation. You can see, just kind of skim over those verses. Just as we heard at the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua 24, these verses also describe the death of Joshua and the passing of that entire generation of Israelites. These were the Israelites who had seen God's mighty deeds, both in Egypt as little kids, teenagers, and his mighty deeds in conquering the land of Canaan, going before them as he had promised to do, conquering under Joshua, taking possession of the land that God had promised to Abraham hundreds of years earlier. So this is where we're reading now, verses 1 through 5 of Judges 2. This is before God raises up these temporary crisis management leaders we call judges, that the Bible calls judges. Those deliverers are initially described for the first time here at the end of this chapter. You can just keep scanning down and you can see that. So what we have here, before the judges are introduced, where the book gets its name from, before they are introduced, what we have here is the author setting the stage for those leaders. We're learning why God needed to raise up these judges. We're learning something about important about the condition, the spiritual condition of the people. Now, notice a few things about the passage I just read, verses 1 through 5. First of all, notice how the angel of Yahweh speaks for or as Yahweh himself. Did you see that? He speaks for or as Yahweh God himself, the God of Israel. That's in verse 1. What does he reveal? Well, he points us back to the book of Exodus. Remember, angel means messenger, so he really is just bringing the word of God, almost as if a prophet would bring the word of God. What is revealed in this message? Well, we're pointed back to the book of Exodus. God says, I made a covenant with you. I'll never break that covenant with you. Right? He's not going to renege on his side of the deal. Exodus 19, that's where it takes us back to God's covenant with his people, what we would call the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic Covenant or the Sinaitic Covenant, that covenant of the law. So, we also, we also learn here, uh, he's also pointing the readers back or the listeners back to how God told the Hebrews that when they finally took possession of the promised land, that they should not make any covenant. He's making a covenant with them, but they should not make any covenant with the inhabitants of the land. Why is that? Because those were nations that God had already judged. But there's more than that. This is what he said specifically in Exodus 23. Take a look on the screen. Exodus 23, verses 23 and 24, also 31 through 33. When my angel, there's the angel of Yahweh again, when my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, all these groups that were living in that land of Canaan, 
And I blot them out, says Yahweh. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them, overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. We heard a little bit about this when Elder Christian shared the word with us a couple weeks ago in Deuteronomy chapter 12. The same ideas. And I will set your border says God, from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines, the Mediterranean, and from the wilderness to the Euphrates. For I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them. This is the initial word that Judges 2 is referring to. When he told them, don't make a covenant with these people. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you, a trap. Notice there the issue is not that Gentiles be among the Israelites. There were Gentiles. Right? There, there were Gentiles among the, the, the Hebrews. The issue was with these groups, and not simply the, what the individuals represented, but what they worship, what they believed, the patterns of their lives, the temptations that they represented would be a snare, would be a, a pit, would be a trap. But there's a second thing I want you to notice about our main text here, Judges 2, 1 through 5. A second thing that I hope you notice from our main passage, specifically verse 2. It's confirmation that God's people did not ultimately obey this command. That's kind of the gist of this passage, isn't it? They did not obey this command not to make any covenant. Their failure is described for us in the previous chapter, Judges chapter 1. Look back or flip back to Judges 1 and look at how their disobedience came to pass. This is quite interesting. Though Joshua 23 describes domination of the land in general. What do I mean by that? It means that in general, Joshua and the Israelites conquered the land that God told them to. God, it says God came through in all of His promises. Now, there were pockets of people here and there but God had already told them way back, I'm not going to drive at everybody at the same time. If I did that, then you'd have a lot of fallow ground and it, it, just, it wouldn't be good. The, 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 the thorns and the weeds would take things over too quickly. So he's going to drive them out incrementally. So there's this general, leaving the book of Joshua, we have this general sense that God has accomplished his purposes through Joshua, the conquest. It, uh, Joshua 23 describes the domination of the land in general, and it describes the right momentum, that the people have the right momentum in terms of driving out the remaining nations. That's how the book of Judges op opens up. They're continuing forward in this driving out of these peoples. But the turning point comes in Judges 119. Look at 119. It says this, and Yahweh was with Judah, and he, it's talking about the whole tribe, but using the name of their ancestor, right? He, Judah, took possession of the hill country, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Now, now, now this is key. Notice the language there. Judah could not drive out Canaanites in the plains. They did well in the hill country, but they could not do so in the plains. Why? Well, the answer is given to us because their iron chariots, the iron chariots of the Canaanites gave them a military advantage. Now, at this point in the book of Judges, this is what we, we would hope to see. <laughs> we would hope that verse 20 would tell us something like, um, and Judah regrouped and came before the Lord and laid before the Lord and sought the Lord and said, Lord, be our champion. Go before us. Tell us how to defeat the enemy because you promised that you would drive them out before us. You promised this land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You would hope that there would be something like that here, that they would go again like the opening of the book talks about, and they would get their brothers, Simeon, Asher, Gad, 
Dan, Naphtali, Benjamin, they would grab other tribes and they'd say, let's join forces like they did at the opening of Judges 1 and let's take these iron chariot riding Canaanites out together. We don't see that. We don't see any of that. Sadly, we don't find this. Instead, this failure sets off a cascade of compromise. This failure that's explained sets off a cascade of compromise beginning in verse 21. Again, take note of the language. But the people of Benjamin, it doesn't say could not. It says did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Look at verse 27 of chapter 1. Manasseh did not drive out. Verse 29, Ephraim did not drive out. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out. Naphtali, verse 33, did not drive out. Finally, verse 34, we read not about what, the, what Israel failed to do, but what was done to them by the very people that God had delivered into their hands. They were now on the run from them. The Amorite, verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. So one setback that was handled the wrong way, that did not drive them to repentance, leads to this compromise, this toleration, which then leads to defeat. Again, chapter 2, verse 2, I said you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, but you have not obeyed my voice. A third thing I want you to notice about our main text this morning I want you to notice, Judges 2, 1 through 5, notice how God is crystal clear with Israel that their compromise, that their disobedience will not somehow lead to success. If they thought this, <laughs> maybe they were thinking to themselves, you know what, this whole conquest thing, dude, no, it's not, it's not working, you know. This whole conquest thing is just too hard. Instead of fighting these Canaanites or these Jebusites, let's just make a, let's make a deal with them. Let's make an arrangement, right? Less bother, less blood. That sounds like a good deal. Let's make a deal with them. God will eventually get rid of these people somehow, some way, at some time. He'll get rid of them. And once they're subjugated to us, <laughs> what threat could they possibly pose, Right? Wrong. God already warned them. He's clear in chapter 2, verse 3. I will not drive them out before you. When you step in compromise into that, into this situation, when you give in to this, when you choose to disobey my word, when you allow this compromise to exist here, you can be sure I will not drive them out before you, but they shall in fact become thorns in your sides and their God shall be a snare to you. What I warned you about will happen. If you're foolishly thinking I will somehow step in and help you in the midst of your disobedience, you are wrong, you are mistaken, says God. Verse 4 and 5 simply confirm for us that the people had indeed disobeyed. And that confirmation comes through their acknowledgement. We read about how they acknowledged their compromise. And we read about their repentance, which is indicated here when it talks about them sacrificing to Yahweh. So, with all of that in mind, Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Judges 1 this opening story. Let's now circle back to Romans 15 and Acts 19. That's where we started. Take a look again at Romans 15 here on the screen. Romans 15, 4. For whatever, what, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Whatever was written in former days. That's talking about the Old Testament. That means we should be asking, how does God want to use Judges 2, 
1 through 5 for our instruction. Well, think about what the writer of Judges wanted the first readers of the book to take away from this same passage. You can never go wrong when you simply ask, what was the author's intention behind the words of Scripture? The original author's intention to his first readers, what were they? That's where we always have to start. And that's what we're asking here. What did he intend to communicate to those Hebrew readers? So when you consider everything that came before Judges 2, like going all the way back to Abraham, all the way up through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, if we consider that along with everything else the book of Joshua tells us, all the way to Judges, sorry, everything the book of Judges tells us, all the way to Judges chapter 21... I think it's fair to say that Judges 2 drives home the fact, take a look here, drives home the fact that when we simply, sinfully compromise with that which God has already judged, allowing it to remain where God has already conquered, we must accept that we are already defeated when it comes to temptation. Let me read that again. When we sinfully compromise with that which God has already judged, allowing it to remain where God has already conquered, we must accept that we're already defeated when it comes to temptation. Okay, so remember this. Book of Joshua, it ended with Israel confirming their covenant commitment. Remember that? Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve Yahweh. Remember that? And the people say, we will. And Joshua says, you won't be able to. And they say, we will. We will serve him. So there's this covenant commitment at the end of the book of Joshua. They are looking to Yahweh, the true God, their mighty redeemer. And though the book of Judges begins with God's people continuing in obedience, right? They're going to carry out the conquest as God called them to do. As we saw, their gains are eclipsed by their compromise. That's how the chapter 1, you heard it. It just, bing, 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 bing. It just keeps emphasizing that same point. They did not drive out these people. They did not drive out these people. They did not drive out these people. They allowed them to remain. They made a deal with them. They tolerated them there. And what they allowed to remain in disobedience to God's word does exactly what God promised it would. Look at 2, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 in your Bible. Judges 2, 11 and 12. Here's the result. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and they served the Baals, Canaanite deities. And they abandoned Yahweh, the God of their fathers, the God who brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods, which gods? From among the gods of the peoples who were around them. And they bowed down to them. And they provoked Yahweh to anger. Brothers and sisters, from the period of the judges... Fast forward in time to first century Ephesus. Remember that scene? Think with me about what would have happened if those new Christians would have simply kept all of their occult material, all their occultic materials instead of burning them. All the scrolls they once used in their magic arts. What would happen if they kept those? Well, they would have unwisely allowed stumbling blocks to remain where God had already conquered. And they would have set themselves up for likely defeat in the face of ongoing temptations from those same books. Guaranteed failure? No. But very likely. Foolish to allow those things to continue to exist, to continue to tempt them. So in their weakest moments, they might go back and say, oh, God's not answering my prayer. Oh, 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 this something's got to change. Oh, wait a minute. There was once an incantation that I read on a scroll. Maybe 
Maybe if I just find that again and dig it out, maybe if, 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 if God's not answering this prayer, maybe I could use this and it would bring rain or it would bring healing or it would bring prosperity that I need because I'm in a financial bind. You see, the temptation would be there, wouldn't it? And they would unwisely allow that temptation to be there, setting themselves up for likely defeat in, li- in the face of those ongoing temptations from their former life. But unlike God's people in the opening chapters of Judges, these new covenant believers in Ephesus, they reject such compromise. They do not allow those things to remain. Neither should we. How does God want to use Judges 2, 1 through 5 for our instruction, to use the words of Paul again? He wants us to be faithful to His Word and reject compromise when it comes to stumbling blocks in our lives today. Now, let me be clear about what this means. Rejecting compromise in light of God's Word today if, we, if we're looking at the Judges chapter 2, it does not necessarily mean rejecting the sinful, idolatrous people around us, right? We might think, oh, well, the application is, is that the people of the land need to be rejected. We can't have anything to do with the people of the land. As God's new covenant people, we have no command to conquer those outside the covenant. That's not a new Testament thing. We have no command to conquer those outside the covenant. And Paul actually speaks to the possibility of this distortion of thinking about our separation from the people around us, idolatrous, sinful people around us. He's clear about this in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. He says this, take a look. I wrote to you in my letter, brothers and sisters in Corinth, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Ha ha! Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world. It's not what I'm talking about, says Paul. Or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. A general speaking against monasticism, I think, there. Ascetic life of just leaving, going to hide out in the desert. (laughs) The church is meant to be in the culture Right? We're in the midst of this world. We need to go out of the world not to associate with, uh, with sinful, idolatrous people. But Paul clarifies, now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed. And the implication here is unrepentant sexual immorality or greed. Or if the brother is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Don't send the wrong message to this person that everything's okay. It's not, Paul says. For what, I have, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? Oh, if the church would take that to heart, that, that idea. <laughs> We've spent a lot of time judging outsiders, haven't we? Lots of time. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Paul says, purge the evil person from among you. So actually, with a little bit of a possible air entering into that passage, we come out with an application of Judges chapter 2. This is one application, this principle to remove, to guard against compromise within the church to not neglect church discipline, the process that Jesus himself gave us, but if necessary, removing those who are stubbornly unrepentant from the church. Just as God called the Israelites to remove these idolatrous people from the midst of the land. But I think the more common application for us to, today will be, should be daily vigilance in our own lives. Church discipline situations like this, they don't, they don't happen all that often. But every single day, we can apply these things in our own hearts. We deal with these same issues. So allow me to share a couple principles that I pray will be helpful to you. Remember, we're looking and thinking about our brothers and sisters long ago in Ephesus. 
burning those magic scrolls. We're thinking about the, the failure side of things with God's people in, the, in Judges chapter 2 who did not drive out those whom God had called to be driven out. So as we think about that and applying that, think about this first point here. First of all, though our call to reject compromise may not be as specific, it is still guided by God's word. Though our call to reject compromise may not be as specific, it is still guided by God's word. God did explicitly say in the Old Testament, we just heard it, Exodus 23, do not make covenants with the people of this land. Do not allow them to live among you, continue their lifestyle, don't make deals with them, don't do it. But the New Testament has no verse that explicitly commands the burning of occultic materials. Does it? Enlighten me if you know of a verse that says that. It doesn't. So why did the Ephesians, why did they burn these, these scrolls then? If there's no verse or particular teaching preserved for us that says that, well, I believe it was because they rightly recognized that the power they once sought through such magic arts was completely contrary to the power of God that had now been given to them. In fact, it was more than that. Such practices were ultimately toying with the demonic, weren't they? They begin to understand these principles. They begin to see these principles. As Paul would later write to this same church, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Divulge them. Bring them out into the light. Take no part in those unfruitful works. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. And he also said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, not participating in the work of the devil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. What does all of this mean for you? It means something like this. It means that God's word may not explicitly say, hey, get rid of those questionable movies that you have. It may not explicitly say, dump your smartphone. It may not explicitly say, take down those racy tool posters with those women, scantily clad. It may not say, avoid bikini day at the local pool. It may not say that specifically, but it does call us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its lusts. It does say that. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. You'll see those on the screen here. God's word may not explicitly say, hey, stop hanging out with this or that specific person. You know, you're not going to open it and it's going to say, hey, stop hanging out with Tom. He's worldly. It's not going to say, hey, stop hanging out with Michelle. She's worldly. Right? She's going the wrong direction. She's a bad influence on you. It doesn't say that specifically, does that. But it does remind us in 1 Corinthians 15, do not be deceived. Bad company ru- ruins good morals. We could bring in that verse about leaven, right? Leavening the whole lump, a little bit of leaven. Or maybe we could actually be talking about books again, like, uh, like the, the Ephesians dealt with. Or maybe it's uh, websites or whatever where you once found in your old life, you once found life advice, you once sought spiritual guidance. Maybe you were once in, a, in another religion or you were in some kind of a cult religion, a cult, uh, and you use materials and you have those things. Maybe it's speaking like that. It doesn't say specifically in God's word, donate that stuff or dump that stuff or burn that book. It doesn't say that. But it says, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. You see, we don't always have the specific word. And sometimes in the name of Christian freedom, we say, oh, it's all good. It's fine. Right? I'm not going to worry about this. It doesn't say it in the Word. But we're not applying the principles and saying, am I allowing to remain what should not remain? Am I allowing a stumbling block to remain in my life that will become for me a source of constant temptation 
Am I setting myself up for failure? As God was trying to warn the Israelites not to do. You see, there are patterns and practices from our old lives. There are things we once held dear, things we once enjoyed. There are people with whom we gladly walked in darkness. There are things like this that will likely lead to sin. That will likely lead to sin. Things like this that we, unlike the Ephesians, foolishly do not drive out of our lives. And what I mean by that is from which we do not wisely distance ourselves. Instead, again, often in the name of Christian freedom, we minimize the threat from such things and we allow them to stay. We keep them in our lives, thus allowing ourselves to remain within reach of their influence. What or who fits that bill in your life? I believe that's what God's asking you this morning. He's asking you, what have you allowed to remain? What are you holding on to that you need to get rid of? That you need to let go of? That you need to distance yourself from? There's a way to do that, right, in truth and grace. There's a way to do that that's right and healthy. For magic scrolls, the best option for these believers was just to burn them, get rid of them altogether. They came to hate what they represented in opposition to the truth of God, who He was. Who or what fits that bill in your life? Please consider this morning how God might be speaking specifically to you. Think about that. As you do, let me offer a second point here. You'll see it here on the screen. A second point. Second, though we have not been called to conquer a land as God's new covenant people, we should nevertheless reject compromise in light of God's conquest. So if we are to be those like the Ephesians who reject compromise with these things in our life, who will not allow them, who are pushing these things out, we should do so in light of God's conquest. What do I mean by that? Look at these verses. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 calls us enemies of God. Other books talk about hostility of mind towards God. That's how each of us are born into the world, hostile towards God. God haters. That's how we're born, all of us, into the world. Whether you don't see yourself as that or not, the Bible condemns you as such and condemns me as such. We're enemies of God. But 2 Corinthians 2.14 paints this picture. Paul says, but thanks be to God who, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Isn't that beautiful? The, uh, in Rome, there's an arch called the Arch of Titus. It's well known because it depicts the conquest of Jerusalem. And you can even see the, the menorah that they ransacked from the temple of Jerusalem in AD 70 and brought back to the city of Rome. It's there in relief sculpture on, the, on this Arch of Titus. But it's depicting a triumphal procession, right? Under, under Titus, the, the general, coming back to Rome. Christ is pictured here in Paul's thinking as leading us in this conquest, in this victory. And through his victory, through that stunning reality, it leads to another stunning reality in Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Paul says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Enemies become conquerors through the grace of God in Jesus. Is that amazing to you? That is the victory of Jesus. Why did the Ephesians burn their sorcery scrolls? Because they had been conquered by the king of love. And in light of Christ's victory over sin and death on the cross and their subsequent surrender as sinners through his grace, they rejected this idea of sinfully compromising with that which God had already judged that is, allowing these likely stumbling blocks to remain where God had already conquered. That is, in their hearts, in their lives. They understood that to do so was not only out of step with faith in the gospel, rejection of sin, embrace of Christ, but that it would lead to eventual defeat in the face of tolerated temptations in their life. Why would they do that? 
Let's be clear. This rejection of compromise that we're talking about today, the failure in Judges 2 to do so, the success in in Ephesus in Acts 19, this failure, this rejection of compromise does not lead us to peace with God or secure eternal life with us, for us, does it? Does it? It doesn't. Absolutely it doesn't. No, this putting away of stumbling blocks that we're talking about flows from the reality of peace with God now, the reality of eternal life now, both secured by the uncompromising righteousness of Jesus. That's our security. And what flows from that assurance is a life that says, I've been conquered by the king of love. I am in his retinue. I am following him. And I don't want to allow these things to trip me up, these things from before, these things from the the world. So my closing question to you is this. Have you been conquered by the king of love? Have you been conquered by the king of love, Jesus? If you haven't, then I urge you today, lay your weapons down. Lay them down. I promise you that you will never regret surrendering to God in light of Christ's victory. You will never regret that. If you have been conquered by the king of love, brother, sister, then by his grace, work out your salvation in light of his victory. Work out your Christian life in light of that victory. Seek to imitate Christ. Seek to grow in grace and purity and love. Practically, that involves many things, but one of the things it does involve is identifying what remains in terms of what God has already judged, recognizing the spiritual danger of potential stumbling blocks in your life, and then purging those things out of your life with holy boldness, courage, instead of the possibility of compromising with with that which God has condemned. Now, in many cases, neither I nor any brother or sister can tell you what must be driven out. It's not my job to tell you that, right? I can't say, hey, you don't take that poster down. You don't get rid of that phone that you're stumbling with, pornography, if you don't get this person who's a kind of toxic out of your life, you know, you're going to be in sin. I can't say that. But what God's Word does is it gives us truth. And as we go to that truth, we trust that the Holy Spirit is there to guide us. And part of His guiding work, it says in the Gospel of John, is to convict us. To convict us. And then empower us to live a new life in light of our king's conquest. Don't suppress the conviction of God in your life. Don't deaden your conscience to that. Don't turn away and say, well, no, I'll rationalize my way out of this box. I don't, I don't want to hear this. Be sensitive to the conviction of God. And when he says, hey, this thing, are you permitted to have it? Well, in Christian freedom, yeah. But everything that's 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 legal, everything that's allowable is not always profitable. Paul taught us that in 1 Corinthians, right? Just because it's permissible doesn't mean it's profitable. How unwise it would be to leave these things. God is telling you this morning, He is, he is pressing you in love through Christ. And he is saying, drive these things out. Throw them in the fire. Get rid of them. Brothers and sisters, Let's thank God for all the fact that all Scripture is given for our instruction. Amen? It's given for our instruction. So let me pray, and let's pray in light of the word that God has given us.